nestled in a once sleepy, quiet valley near Land's End in Cornwall, is P.K. Porthcurno, the Museum of Global Communications. This site has been of world importance ever since a submarine telegraph cable was landed here back in 1870. And it continues to this day to have importance for communications around the world. What you are about to see and hear is the history of this fascinating place. So just sit back and enjoy this riveting story of human endeavour. It's quite a tale, so feel free to stop the film at any point, have a chat with your friends, a cup of tea or two, and then when you are ready, just press play again. If you'd like to investigate further after you've watched this film, just go to the museum's website, www.pkporthkerno.com. From the 17th century onwards, mail sent from Britain to the continent and further afield was by a system of shipping called the Packet Ship Service. Falmouth was the centre for this passage of mail as it was a large, deep water port and it was easy for the ships to get out into good sailing conditions and be on their way. The ships and crew were contracted by the Royal Mail. Communication was of great value for trade and also for the management of Britain's vast global empire. However, it could take six weeks to send a message by sea to Bombay, now known as Mumbai, and at least the same time for the answer to come back. Here we have a single Morse key, used by telegraph operators to send messages in Morse code. This one is on a mahogany base with brass fittings. The telegraph operator would tap out the message, a short tap for a dot and a longer tap for a dash. This one is from about 1900. Here's a bit of background for you. Electricity and later the effects of electromagnetism had been understood from the early 1800s. Harnessing electrical impulses sent down a wire and turned into a code meant that messages could be sent very quickly. The American, Samuel Morse, collaborated with two other men, Leonard Gale and Alfred Vail. They simplified his original design and built an instrument with a key to be tapped and an ink pen to rise and fall that inscribed a line of dots and dashes. They also refined a signal code that Morse had been working on with short and long bursts of current. This was later developed into the dots and dashes that we know as Morse code today. By the 1840s, the telegraph was becoming increasingly popular for sending messages overland. Because Britain was driven by commerce and was also in control of the large and diverse empire, there was the desire to extend the telegraph communication beyond our shores, and the only way to do this would be via undersea cables. You can see the extent of the empire here, coloured pink, in our map from 1850. Improved communication links were beneficial for the cotton and other trades between the United States and Great Britain, together with the cotton trade in India. The New Zealand gold rush in the 1860s caused an influx of people to the South Island and in 1876 the submarine cable connection was made between New Zealand and Australia, prompted by the increased population. Many Europeans had arrived who were expecting the efficiency, communication and products of Europe. To use the telegraph under the sea meant insulating the electricity-carrying copper wires from the disintegrating and conducting effects of seawater. In 1845, a material called gutta percha was found to be perfect at both waterproofing and insulating the wires when they were coated with it. 
Gutta percha comes from the sap of the Malayan percha tree and is a rubber-like material. At room temperature, it is hard, but when heated, either by flame or hot water, it becomes temporarily soft and malleable. The material created a flexible, waterproof and insulating coating around the core of the copper wire, which was then wrapped around with tarred hemp. Historically, gutta percha had been used to make golf balls called gutties, or briefly for constructing false teeth. The cable companies owned vast plantations of the Malayan percha trees in the Far East. However, the material and the workers were exploited really, and the trees were felled in vast numbers, and the resource became unsustainable. A cable made in this way was laid in 1850 from England to France, but it stopped working within a day or so. Various lively stories grew up over time, saying that a fisherman had caught the cable in his nets, brought it aboard, not knowing exactly what it was, imagining that it was a length of seaweed with a golden core, and took it back to port. Wow, if only that were true. I think I might race down to my local beach right now just to check the shoreline for seaweed with golden centres. Our picture shows a piece of the actual English Channel cable and the image on the right shows how the single copper wire was encased in the gutter percha. Here's a wonderful illustration of the ship Goliath laying the cable in the channel in 1850. Can you see the massive reel lying horizontally on the deck with the cable being paid out from it over the stern? The next year, another cable was laid. This time, the gutta percha covered copper wires were encased in tar covered hemp, then spun hemp, and finally spiral wound with 10 iron armor wires. At least now, the cable would be protected from the sharp submerged coastal rocks, which likely caused the previous year's cable to fail. In our picture, we have so many examples of failed cable. This was a training board to teach young telegraphers what could go wrong with the cables and thus break transmission. Trawl a mall, spewed, perished or strained cores, torado damage, and my favourites, fish bites or crab nests. Shark bites, snapping turtles or damage caused by earthquakes Ships' anchors or chafing against the seabed all represented hazards for an undersea cable. You wonder how any messages ever got through. Now we move to the dreaded Torado Navalis. The example here is dried and wrapped in a loop with the head bottom left. It's known as the naval shipworm because of its appearance. And some species around the world can reach 1.8 metres or 6 foot long. If they managed to bore into submarine cables, they would absolutely decimate them. Although they look like worms, they're actually mollusks. And the last remnants of a shell, those white curls in our picture, have become sharp, scything jaws, which can manage 2,300 rasps every hour. That's 38 rasps a minute. En masse, the larvae or tiny young adult creatures would manage to slide through any small gaps in even the armoured cable and bore their way in to feast on the hemp and the gutta percha inside. They could go right through the insulating gutta percha layer to expose the copper wires, thus creating a dead earth fault in the circuit. Disastrous. These same boring mollusks have become infamous in history for destroying wooden ships' hulls, piers and wharves with their appetites. They were notorious for eating through the wooden dikes in Holland, necessitating the defences there to be rapidly replaced with stone in the 1730s. 
From about 1880, a brass tape was often wrapped around the core of gutta percha coated copper wires and tar covered hemp through which the teredo couldn't penetrate. Phew. In this cut piece of cable from 1905, we can see the two wrappings of armour wires looking like neatly arranged silvery tiddlywinks in circles towards the outside, and a brass ring, which is the brass tape, near the centre, enclosing and protecting the seven orange-coloured copper wires in the middle. But back to 1857 now, when the first unsuccessful attempt was made to lay an undersea transatlantic cable. Another cable was successfully laid in 1858, but stopped working after a month. The experts hadn't yet perfected the science for reliable message transmission. A Scottish textile merchant based in Manchester named John Pender was a director of the Atlantic Telegraph Company. In 1865, a new cable was proposed which was loaded onto Isambard Kingdom Brunel's SS Great Eastern, the only ship afloat capable of carrying the 2,000 miles of cable necessary to cross the Atlantic. Unfortunately, the cable broke and the ship had to return to Europe. The next year, in 1866, another attempt was made, and this time it was successful, together with the SS Great Eastern picking up and repairing, after 30 grappling attempts, the previous year's broken cable. Now there were two operational transatlantic cables. Just brilliant. John Pender was very keen to connect Britain to her empire by submarine cables. He approached the government to do this, but was turned down. He set up three limited liability cable companies responsible for the various legs of this epic undertaking. Cable would have originally been laid from Falmouth via Gibraltar and Malta on its way to Bombay but Falmouth was a really busy commercial port, as we've said, and the chance of damage to the cable by anchors was great. Porthcurno was picked to land the cable instead. Here was a quiet cove with a sandy beach with no boats anchoring in the bay. It had the added advantage of an already existing telegraph line linking the valley to Penzance fortuitously installed for a previous project. Here you can see the telegraph wires draping their way down the valley in the centre of our illustration from 1870. The cable from Porthcurno to Bombay. A cable would be laid from Porthcurno to Gibraltar and then to Malta via Carcavelos in Portugal. Another would connect Italy, Malta and Egypt, and the last would join Suez, Aden and Bombay, a cable having gone to connect Alexandria and Suez overland via the Egyptian telegraph system. The cable was fabricated in London at Greenwich, Morden and North Woolwich and loaded directly onto the cable laying ships, except for the Great Eastern, affectionately known as Great Babe by Brunel, as she was just too big to come up the Thames. She was moored at Sheerness and the cable was transferred to her in hulks in much the same way as we see in our picture here from 1865. What we see here are the men in the vast cable tanks of the Great Eastern managing the cable passing up through the hole in the roof onto the deck above to then be fixed into the paying out machinery which controlled the cable as it was laid out over the stern of the ship onto the seabed below. To make sure the cables in her tanks didn't get overheated, the Great Eastern's hull and funnels were painted white 
which were then repainted to take the cable across the Indian Ocean and up the Red Sea. Records show that this tactic was highly successful, as the temperature below deck was indeed 8 degrees Fahrenheit cooler than above deck. This picture shows the ship Investigator landing the cable onto the beach at Porthcurno in early June 1870. The cable ship Hibernia making the final splice or join further offshore on June the 8th. The whole route from Porthcurno to Bombay took 5,000 miles of cable and it was known as the Red Sea Line. Here is a sketch of perhaps John Pender with Sir Samuel Canning and one other in a temporary cable hut up the valley, dictating the first test message to Bombay. I bet their hearts were thumping that this great endeavour would work perfectly, don't you? These are decorative samples from the cables used on the Porthcurno to Bombay route which were presented to John Pender on its completion. Note the different diameters of the samples, the heavily armoured sections as shore ends where the chance of damage is the greatest and lightly armoured cable used in the deep sea sections of the cable lay. Also see that the outer armour wires were nearly all wrapped in layers of jute which had been dipped in a mixture of hot tar pitch and linseed oil to protect and preserve them. Here we have a picture from the Illustrated London News, the first message to Bombay. It was sent from a soiree Pender held at his glamorous London address on the 23rd of June 1870. He even had the grapnel, a hooked grab, which the SS Great Eastern had used to recover the 1865 transatlantic cable, hung from a balcony to dramatic effect. The first message between London and Bombay was received in five minutes. The message said, how are you all? Five minutes later, the reply returned, all well. There were dignitaries from Britain and India, and the guest of honour was the Prince of Wales, later King Edward VII, pictured in the centre of our image. He sent a best wishes message to the Viceroy of India, who was in his bed, poor chap, but roused himself to send an encouraging reply. The Viceroy was in Simla in northern India. The message took just 11 minutes to reach him up there in the foothills of the Himalayas. Previously, as we've said, it would have taken six weeks to send this message from England to India. Now it was just a few minutes. The set of equipment at each location consisted of a cable key, not a standard Morse key, to send the special signals used on the cable and a siphon recorder on the right of our picture, which wrote the incoming signals on paper tape, a sample of which is shown on the left. In 1872, Pender amalgamated his various companies and they became known as the Eastern Telegraph Company. He also had cables laid which set up direct communications with Australia and China in the 1870s. By 1880, globally, there were also 100,000 miles of submarine cable. Porthcurno had become the hub of global communication. At the height of the British Empire, the cables that passed through Porthcurno were absolutely key to Great Britain's governance over 450 million people and one quarter of the world's land mass. John Pender was knighted in 1888. We see him here from that same year. 
the Porthcurno Valley had been largely uninhabited before the cable arrived, save for a farm or two and fishermen who worked the coves either side of Porthcurno. With the messages coming ashore, telegraphers were needed to relay them onwards manually. Zodiac House, you see here, was built in 1870 and housed the telegraph station and the staff quarters. In 1871, there were 15 members of staff at Porthcurno and by the next year, this had almost doubled to 27, 15 of whom were trainees. These were young British men who had come down to Cornwall to learn to be telegraphers, some as young as 14. They had to pay for their keep and would be unpaid until they were successfully trained and sent off abroad to the new cable stations that were opening up around the globe. After 2,000 miles, the signal in the cable would become so weak as to be unintelligible. So it was important to receive it prior to that point, interpret it and send it onwards, boosted for the next leg of its journey. Across the world, there were relay stations along the lines where telegraphers would listen out for the signal, interpret it and send it on. Some of the stations were in very remote places where the operators might paddle a boat to work, maybe spending half the year virtually alone, perhaps on an Indian Ocean deserted island living in very simple accommodation. Here is the station on Fanning Island, a very remote island in the South Pacific, halfway between Fiji and Hawaii in 1953. In other places like Gibraltar or Singapore, the staff enjoyed the high life of expatriates abroad. Often, staff would be away for several years at a time. They referred to themselves as exiles, both by being down in rural Cornwall, far away from the bright lights, and also for the isolation of the cable stations they might be sent to. In 1873, a second submarine cable was landed at Porthcurno, this one going to Vigo in northwest Spain. By now, there were four operational staff and 32 bachelors who lived in the main building. They dealt with around 600 messages every day. In 1877, the superintendent, Mr. Ash, put in two new measures to control the boisterous young men. One was to go to church every Sunday and sign the church attendance return for head office in London. The other was a beer list showing each man's consumption, which was also completed and sent to London. It took a while for their behaviour to calm down and there were more problems with their actions and thus the Eastern Telegraph's good name through their drinking, bad language and loose behaviour. Really? These chaps were certainly determined, that's for sure, because if they wanted to go to Penzance, they would either have to walk the ten miles there on very steep, tortuous roads or pay ten and sixpence to hire a horse and trap. Although there were opportunities for sports as pastimes for the students, life still needed pepping up, apparently. One student bet his pal that no one would swallow the two hairy caterpillars which he kept in a matchbox and wash them down with ginger pop. The wager was sixpence. The challenge was readily accepted by a young man who seemed to suffer no ill effects after his strange appetizer. Jolly hard on the caterpillars, I'd say. In time, more building took place for both work and accommodation and various sports facilities were added. A cricket pitch, tennis courts and the men could join the Exiles Club, which contained a billiard room, library, theatre and they had a football team. Dances and plays took place and young ladies would be brought to the events by bus. Members of the Dramatic Society became part of nearby Rowena Cade's Cliffside Minack Theatre project.
At its height, there were 14 undersea cables coming into the cable hut at the top of the beach, up the cliff at Porthcurno, which was the biggest cable station in the world, with the ability to receive and automatically transmit 2 million words a day. This is the hut, which we can still see inside to this day. This image shows the reality of the cables being brought ashore and then laid up the steep hill to the cable hut we saw just now. That must have been a fierce storm to uncover them so completely, mustn't it? Next image to the right is inside the hut with the cable terminals. Manual operation was superseded by the Regenerator semi-automatic systems introduced in the late 1920s. Marconi sent the first transatlantic radio signal using Morse code from nearby Poldew Cove in December 1901 to St. John's, Newfoundland, Canada. By the 1930s, beam radio networks connected the UK to the extended Commonwealth and complemented the cable routes. In 1929, Marconi's company and the Eastern Telegraph Company were encouraged to amalgamate by the government. It was renamed Cable and Wireless in 1934. Just look at the vast number of radio transmission routes as well as cable routes around the world, shown in this map from 1945. World War II brought the need to increase security as the enemy was only 80 miles away and having the communication system would make the station a target. It was decided to move the whole telegraph system underground for safety. Construction workers dug out the two tunnels and cross passages in just 10 months from July 1940 together with cutting 119 granite steps up into the hillside for emergency exit from within. The site was further protected with trenches and flamethrowers. The messages continued to get through and the longest break was 13 days from December 1940 when London was burning. If things got desperate, a suitcase filled with telegraph messages was put on the night train to Paddington. Post-war, it was found that there was a serious shortage of trained technicians to look after the machines abroad. Cable and Wireless realised that they could train 50 students simultaneously from overseas and maintain their influence on international communications routes. Some of the training was carried out in London and then the students would come to Cornwall, sometimes bringing their families with them. St Levin Primary School gained pupils from many different countries and cultures to everyone's enrichment. The old cricket ground was brought back to life, the tennis courts spruced up and the cricket practice strip recut. British students studied alongside others from all over the world and 70% of the students were international. The college continued for 40 years, in which time the training was cable, wireless, radio, but also telephone engineering and satellite. The cable telegraph network was closed in 1970, 100 years after the first cable was landed. In 1993, the college closed and moved to Coventry. Shortly after the college closed, a small number of staff and enthusiasts opened up a small museum in the tunnels, preserving the historic machinery, the precious beginnings of the collection that the museum now has. However, that is not the end of the communication story for Porthcurno by any means. From the 1980s, fibre optic cables came into operation. 
These are vast lengths of glass as fine as a human hair, which can carry pulses of light at 99.7% of the speed of light. These are laid across the seabed in much the same way as the historic cables. There are 14 fibre optic cables which make landfall in Cornwall, and four of these arrive at Porthcurno. We might think that most of our communications happen by satellite, but surprisingly, that's not the case. 97% of all our internet communications, emails, Google searches, international phone calls are still by undersea cable. Maybe your own messages are leaving and returning via Porthcurno. Let's hope so. And you thought you'd had a bad day. Just imagine trying to sort out this nest of cables. This is the end of our film. We hope you've enjoyed this wonderful story. Remember to check the video notes below this film for access to our museum website at www.pkporthkerno.com. You'll also find the Hereth link to access more wonderful stories in this similar style.